Can you hear me fine? Yeah? OK, great. So it's a pleasure to be here. Actually, the, the first time a speaker at PyCon. I must say that it's a, quite a, a, a moment. So hope uh, you'll enjoy this, uh, this wonderful talk. So I uh, am Alessandro Volpe. Or I work as a um, head of data science in BPEX Tech, which is a consulting company, uh, a competence center inside this consulting company offering machine learning, cloud engineering, and f uh, lots of funny stuff to, to customers. And most importantly of all, I like, I love graphs. Well, I kind of, well, I, I forced myself to, to like graphs. Because actually some, some time ago, my, my wife decided to renovate the apartment. And so I thought to myself, well, uh, amongst all the possible strategies to avoid doing anything in the house, what could I do? So I started studying graph machine learning. So uh, I hope it was a good idea, but at least I'm here. So that's me actually trying to sell you some graph. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I'd like to, to share a couple of things with you today. So some boring theory on uh, what graphs are and some interesting theory on how we can do actually machine learning with graphs and finally some hopefully insightful uh, stuff with what we can do with machine learning on the cloud. How many of you just to know work with graphs in, in Python? A few, few people by raise of hands. Okay, graph machine learning Okay, okay. This would be a, uh, let's say, gentle introduction to, to graph machine learning, but of course, if you have questions, uh, I'm available later. So all you need to know on graphs to, to understand this lecture, uh, this, this talk is right on this slide. So a graph is a structure. Uh, it represents uh, entities or objects, which are actually called nodes or vertices. And these nodes uh, might share a relationships with one another. And these relationships are represented by edges or links that link or connect uh, to nodes. And uh, one easy example of what a um, graph uh, could be is uh, the uh, airport hub. So you can imagine airports and, as points on the map. And those are the nodes and the routes the flights that connect the two airports are actually the links or the edges that connect it. Uh, and that's all you need to know, basically. Uh, I love graph. Python also loves graphs. So there are plenty of, um, plenty of uh, libraries that you can use in Python to uh, define, to, to manipulate, to do analysis on graphs. And there are some uh, over there. I will present some, some examples using uh, Network X. And if you, do, if you want to do some more, uh, say, funny stuff, or you want to, to push a little bit further with some uh, machine learning or uh, deep learning on, uh, on graphs, those are some uh, popular, uh, let's say, uh, libraries to use. Uh, so Stellar Graph, Deep Graph Library, and Karate Club. So some Python code just to, uh, as an appetizer, so quite easy on uh, Network X to, to define a graph. So you instantiate the, uh, the object, nx.graph, and you define a set of vertices uh, with uh, unique identifiers and another set of tuples that represent the, the edges, so the connections between the nodes, so Milan, Dublin, going back to, to the examples from before, and then uh, method uh, add nodes from, add edges from, and there you go. Okay, you have a graph. That's one way to represent it. There are other ways, of course. Uh, you can represent it as, uh, as a, an ad, uh, adjacency. Uh, I cannot actually pronounce it. Uh, adjac adjacency matrix, which is a, a binary matrix in this case, uh, where, where the ones are actually where the, the node, the, the the edges connect to to nodes. There are plenty of different types of graphs, uh, directed graphs, undirected graph, multigraph, multi undirected graph, weighted graph, pseudo graph. Do we care? No, no, because we're here for the machine learning on graphs, okay? <laughs> so let's skip the uh, boring theory part and let's go straight to the, to the interesting part. So how do we do machine learning on graphs, okay? We can do the, um, some way, the, uh, the, the classic way around so we can let's say, start with a uh, classical feature engineering process where we define some uh, attributes 
related to our data structure. And imagine you uh, are a, uh, I don't know, a telecommunication company. You have the, the, uh, the data set representing all your customers that uh, can communicate with each other. And you want to, to understand the probability that one of them uh, accepts a promotion for an upselling of a service. Okay. What do you do? You can build a, a classification model, for example. And uh, so, uh, as, a data, uh, as a data scientist, you can define uh, node attributes. So, you associate with each one of your customers some features that describe them. So, the, their age, their aging, so how, how long they have they stayed with you as a company, the number of children, the, the color of the hair, uh, every kind of thing your twisted data scientist mind can think of might be relevant to to describe your uh, um, your your customer uh, and then you also think that well my, my customers are in some way communicating with each other so can it be that uh, a person that is close to another is themselves inclined to accept an offer and that feature actually is helpful to um, allow me to identify which customers are more inclined to accept my offer because they're friends with friends or related with other people that are inclined to accept the offer. And so you start to define some local structural features. So for example, you might want to uh, understand how important that customer is, how many people is he uh, talking to how many people he is related to, um, but also with which customers he is communicating with. And so you start with Alice, and you see that it's uh, really small, but or Alex, which I can read, is uh, speaking with, uh, with, with Lisa. But Alex is also speaking with uh, Anna, but it's not speaking with Tom, okay? Besides this, Alex is not speaking, is speaking with uh, Anna. I, I totally forgot the names, but he's speaking with Anna. And Anna is speaking with Giacomo, okay? And uh, Anna might not be that inclined to accept an offer, but Giacomo is, okay? So what do you do? You define all the possible couples of relations that connect uh, uh, your uh, Alice to all the other customers around, but this is actually unfeasible, it, it explodes exponentially, it's not doable, okay, in reality. And you're also bounded by the uh, neighborhood of, that you're exploring, okay? You're going uh, one relation over, two relations over, three relations over, and you, you, you lose actually uh, manageability of this. What do you do? You need something else, okay, to actually represent the context of your customer, the context of the node of your graph. And these things are called embeddings. So the, the embeddings, this falls in the field of representation learning, which is actually trying to uh, learn a, a mapping function that goes from the um, discrete domain of graphs to a continuous domain, which in some ways uh, allows to, to represent represent graph by preserving the properties of the graph itself so that if you apply it to, to nodes in a graph they are mapped as points in a multi-dimensional uh, space you apply it to edges same way around they are mapped to points to vectors in a multi-dimensional space and you can do the same with graphs themselves they become vectors in a multi-dimensional space okay which is easy but if I was eight years old, okay, I would explain this uh, as such. I take my graph, I have a funnel, I ship the graph into the funnel, I squeeze it, I compress it some way, and I obtain another thing that represents a compressed version of my graph under a different perspective. But I want to preserve the properties of the original objects. So nodes that are similar in some way in the original graph, so they are connected by the same edges, they are related in some way to one another, are mapped to points which are close to one another in another, uh, in another domain. Edges that connect the same network, the same uh, sets of edges, are mapped as points close to one another 
okay, similar to one another in another space. And the same with graphs. Graphs that are similar in structure with one another are mapped to points in another space. And this uh, actually, what, what is, uh, is tricky here is to define a kind of similarity, okay, so that the properties in the original domain are preserved in the target domain. And uh, this uh, paper here presents uh, a really uh, nice, uh, let's say, uh, taxonomy to describe the uh, types of models that, are, uh, that fall under the hat of unsupervised machine learning that do this kind of stuff. So they're um, divided in, uh, uh, according to this paper, shallow embeddings, autoencoders, or graph neural networks. In all these examples, you have um, ways okay, to uh, create this embedding. And on this talk, just for, for the sake of uh, simplicity and time, of course, I will uh, focus on, uh, on the screen. Uh, skip gram family of algorithms, and in particular, the, the node to vec, okay? The node to vec works as such, so four steps. First, you take your graph, <coughs> done, okay, easy, gratis. Okay, second, second step, you build the context around your nodes, okay? So iteratively, you take, you take each one of your nodes and you define random walks starting from that node. So what are random walks? Basically are sequences of uh, nodes visited starting from the target node according to certain, uh, certain criteria that are defined in the algorithm itself. So you start from that node, and according to some, pro uh, to some probabilities, you visit another node, visit another node, etc., And you create for each one of your node a set of random walks that represent the context around your node because you visit other nodes starting from the original one. And you take this as your training set and you pass it through, you use it to train a skip gram model. Okay, so it's a shallow uh, neural network and you take the uh, weight matrix in the uh, hidden layer and that weight matrix is actually what represents your uh, embedding in the target domain because the, um, the uh, skip gram model learns okay, to rebuild the context of your original graph. How many of you work with uh, natural language processing? Okay, how many of you uh, work with the word to vec Okay, you basically learned nothing new here, okay? Same stuff, same identical stuff. Your input graph, is like your original text, okay? Uh, what's actually innovative in here is the process of generating uh, random walks with uh, represent your sentences, basically, on, uh, on your text. And what you do is actually applying a word to vec algorithm to your sentences. And, and those actually map the uh, words, which are your uh, notes in here, to a space where uh, you can measure the similarity of words with cosine similarity, okay? Same stuff. And uh, it's as easy as that. Three lines of code besides the, the importing of the library. You define node to vec, you pass it the, uh, the graph, define the, the number of dimensions you want your embedding to be. Typically, uh, the, uh, I think the, um, the, the default is uh, 64, but you can use dimensionality reduction algorithms to actually represent those 64 dimensions to, for example, a b-dimensional space to uh, actually see it, okay, to, to be able to, to graph it. Uh, you fit your model, and then you take your, um, your word vectors, and those are the embeddings, and there you go, okay? Easy as that. Now, I promise to do this on the cloud, okay? So let's uh, jump right into it. For, um, for uh, the, the use case, I will uh, be using a, um, a, a data set from Kaggle, okay? The, the data set is a simulation of credit card transactions. And in this case, you can see the, the graph. In this case, the graph is uh, called a heterogeneous graph because the, the nodes have different types. In, in this case, you have users, okay? which uh, hold uh, uh, credit cards, and the other nodes are actually the merchants, so the, the shops where people spend their money in. And uh, what uh, the uh, objective of the use case is, uh, is actually to 
try to classify if a transaction uh, is uh, a fraud. A fraud for credit cards can be when someone of course, steals your, your credit card and spends money, of course, uh, in your place, or someone hacks your, uh, your account and does the same. So it's kind of difficult to, to prevent, so it's uh, actually important to try to define ways to identify in a, in a fast manner frauds to be able to uh, avoid, of course, uh, well, to, to, to raise a dispute and avoid, of course, this kind of behavior. And um, for doing this, uh, I'll be using a uh, notebook that uh, is actually running on uh, uh, Google Cloud Platform on Vertex AI. You know Vertex? Uh, how many of you, or less? Okay, on Google Cloud. Uh, cloud platform, public cloud platform, uh, which offers a number of services for doing uh, lots of lots of stuff. Vertex AI is one of these, so it's a pla it's a an AI platform that uh, simplifies and helps uh, developers and data science and machine learning engineers to prototype and to put uh, uh, models in, in production and maintain the model in production with all the uh, machine learning engineering pipeline. Okay, here I have a. Jupyter Notebook, I'm not connected to the internet, so we'll just bear, oh, sorry, you cannot see it. Oops. Okay, let me zoom it a little bit. Can you read it? Yes. Okay, yeah, I'm not connected to the internet. Sorry if it just pops up again. Okay. This is not funny. <laughs> Wait. Because they. Okay, I'll connect later. Um, importing some libraries just for fun. Then, uh, ah, most importantly, would I need cloud to cloud computing or uh, Vertex AI to run this? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, I could do many more stuff uh, on Google Cloud, but I'll just do this uh, for the sake of this presentation. So I'll um, read my data as a, a CSV. Um, I'm downsampling the uh, negative class just to be faster in all the, the execution of the code. And here you, you have your data set with all the, the transaction time, credit card number, merchant, uh, category of the merchant, et cetera, et cetera, with all your label in here, in your data set, which is fraud, not fraud, yeah, of course, if the transaction is labeled uh, as fraud. Okay. So it's not connecting to the internet. Sorry. Okay. Um, count the classes, more or less uh, 1,000 credit cards, uh, 700 merchants. Um, we have uh, a quite atypical situation in here, more or less uh, 6,000 transactions are fraud over 117,000, which is a, a huge number with respect to what it actually is in reality. Okay, in reality, it's much, much lower uh, probability of finding a fraud. In here, um, so we, we are starting from a, a structured data set and we want it to, to convert it to a graph. So what we do, we define a, a function uh, that returns a, a graph object from uh, network X. We define this mapping function, which is a, a dictionary comprehension that runs uh, through all the unique credit cards and merchant values and assigns a ID to each one of them. And uh, we use them to define um, other columns, which are the from and to uh, attributes, which define the, um, the direction in where the money flows, flows, flows from the, the uh, credit card holder, hopefully, to the merchant, okay? What we do then is uh, grouping by from and to transaction and summing up uh, all the frauds and the amounts spent on those transactions. And we define the fraud if at least one fraud happens between all the, um, uh, the, the transactions between the, cont the, the credit card and the, um, and the merchants. 
uh, then we create the graph starting from the edge list, okay, and then we um, set the attributes, okay, uh, set the attribute time from and to, so defining uh, credit card holders as uh, label one and merchants as label two, okay, Flo flowing from one to two. Um, we also define the uh, edge attributes, which are uh, actually labels assigned to, to the edges. And in here, the amount and the fraud uh, of the, uh, the amount of the transaction and the uh, label fraud is actually assigned to the edge of the transactions. Okay, so also the edge carries information with it. We build it, okay, and it looks uh, more more or less like this, so starting uh, credit card zero spends money on uh, merchant 14, 17, 58, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so in this case, we, we check uh, to if we did things correctly, so if the graph is bipartite, so if you can define two partitions, in this case, credit card holders and merchants, so that there's a partition where no, no edges go the other way around, only from credit cards to, uh, to merchants. Okay, let's draw this. Uh, this in red are just the, the fraudulent activities and you can see that uh, there's a uh, blue point which represents credit card holders and uh, the, the yellow point represents the merchant. Okay, so all the, hopefully, uh, all, all the uh, transactions uh, connect two of those entities. Okay, down with the machine learning standard machine learning stuff, okay? Once we had FD embedding, we have continuous vectors, so we apply whatever kind of machine learning algorithm we want. So we uh, standard uh, train test split, okay? Uh, we uh, select the uh, edges based on their label, okay? And we stratify the sampling based, of course, on, on the uh, distribution, since it's an unbalanced pro uh, problem. And then we rebuild the, the model starting from the subset of edges that we sampled in there, okay? So we'll have a subgraph for training and subgraph for, um, for testing. Finally, time to run the, the node to vec, okay? So we import the, the node to vec, but in this case, we want to classify edges, okay? Not nodes, we want to see if a, an edge uh, is a fraud, okay? It's associated to a fraud, not actually nodes. So what we do is a simple trick, well, actually more than a trick, it's uh, how the edge embedding is defined. We start from node embedding and we apply uh, those functions uh, which you can see as uh, parameters in your uh, pipeline training. Uh, Adamar, uh, average, weighted, uh, L1, L2 are those all transformation that are applied to the embedding on the nodes to define the embedding of the edges. And you use this to actually train your classifier, okay? So you, uh, I'm not optimizing anything here, which uh, really uh, gives me the, the chills because as a data scientist, I would want to optimize stuff, but just for the sake of uh, being fast, uh, we just uh, build a uh, classifier with uh, 100 estimators and the random states as obviously 42. Okay, uh, we, we use the embedding that uh, we are uh, defining here to build a classifier on the training and testing on the test set. And what we get is actually for the four uh, different uh, uh, functions to calculate the embeddings on the edges, the uh, rock curve that appears to be um, satisfactory at least with this one here, the average of better. Be careful, okay, because uh, the, as I said, the, this ones you can see as parameters uh, in your pipeline. So things can go wrong and it can go wrong like this, okay? Of course, there's something not working in here, okay? Uh, and it works uh, as such also in here. Okay, so you can see everything in the training of your parameters, all the, uh, of your algorithms, the, the training, um, the, sorry, the um, parameters of the node to vec, 
uh, algorithm, which I didn't show, the parameters of your classifier, but also the functions for defining all the embedding set as hyperparameters, okay? You can optimize over that with whatever method you, you prefer. You get your classifier and you're good to go, okay? Great. Um, just for uh, a conclusion, just for, yeah, references, if you, if you like, I promise a, a friend of mine to, to sponsor his book, that I'm quite a good writer, a bad person, but a uh, good writer, okay? Graph Machine Learning, but also the, the other books are uh, really, really fine, okay? Thank you very Thank much. you so much. We have lots of questions, so I guess, I, I think we will have time for two or three questions maximum, but I think Alessandro is more than available to, to answer the other question later. So, um, what is the benefit of using graph uh, ML over a classical tabular uh, um, ML for a binary classification problem? And more in general, where are the common use cases where graph machine learning is, is better suited than classical models? Well, um Let's say that uh, the, it came to, a, um, to an understanding that the, uh, for, for some data, the, the connections between entities are even more important okay, than the entities themselves. Okay? And uh, the fact of having the, the possibility of having these relationships mapped and uh, the availability of algorithms to exploit and to actually um, to, to represent those connections in such a way is actually an advantage that uh, in, in some use cases might uh, actually provide some uh, uh, benefits with respect to a classical uh, machine learning uh, algorithm. Uh, classical uh, applications, well, consider that uh, most state-of-the-art um, recommendation systems rely on uh, uh, graph machine learning, okay, they, they use uh, particular graph uh, neural networks to, to do this stuff, but uh, other classical applications might be, for example, um, community detection, so finding um, groups of people that share something together. I uh, worked for a, a company that used that to, um, to understand what kind of uh, uh, family a, a certain uh, um, customer had, so to, to propose new uh, offers for, for the family nucleus, okay? Uh, but also in uh, biochemistry, you can use, uh, for example, um, graph embedding to predict how a uh, new molecule, okay, could look like to, for, for drug discovery and uh, other kinds of applications, okay? Thank you. And is it... Uh Graph machine learning, the state of the art solution for fraud detection problem. Uh, which advent advantages uh, does it have? Autoencoders and N, sorry. Uh, Over autoencoders and N. But. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, let's say that uh, it, it's an approach, okay? Um, can be useful. Uh, again, the, the, the connections between the entities is, a, uh, is an advantage as a a friend of mine in, in the audience so who I spoke to yesterday uh, works in, in payments and uh, he told me actually that uh, it is very vertical in payments. Um, not always it's feasible to apply that kind of algorithm in, uh, for, for example, for credit card issuers because not always you see all the data about all the transactions that are uh, actually uh, performed. So can be useful, it depends on the, uh, on the, on the use case. Okay. And can we apply attention to graphs because the vocabulary might explode? Sorry? Uh, can we apply attention to graphs? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, graph attention networks are a class of uh, graph neural networks and uh, uh, say an evolution of uh, graph convolutional networks and they actually apply um, a, an attention layer to it's, it's different kind of, of application. They, uh, as you saw here, uh, I was not considering a, any kind of um, attribute related to nodes. And besides those kinds of applications that I um, that I um, uh, showed, 
are so-called uh, tra transductive, which means that uh, it learns from uh, the whole data set and if, if you add another node, you need to retrain your whole algorithm as you would do with a word to vec uh, algorithm. Uh, besides those kinds of classes of, uh, of algorithms uh, actually are inductive, so you can uh, give them another node that they can provide a, 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 um, a classification on, on those. And uh, of course they can be, um, they, they're suitable also for accounting for the, um, uh, the, uh, the attributes of the node by, uh, well, performing a certain kind of uh, uh, aggregation of the information that is passed uh, from the context of the node to the node itself. Okay, with, with the process. Okay, time is over. Thank you so much and you. please give a round of applause.